Hi folks, welcome to another episode of NYC CNC. Today we're going to be doing the follow-up video on the muzzle brake that we made. We machined this one for a nine millimeter in a three-part video series. And in that series, I couldn't figure out uh, how to do the dimples. I've since figured that out and we're adding some fourth axis chamfering stuff. So the first few minutes of this video are really pretty hardcore sprut cam stuff. So if you're a sprut cam user, it might be great because we're doing some stuff on the 2G geometry, on hole machining for these fourth axis dimples, fourth axis contouring, uh, importing work pieces to create the right uh, simulations. If you're not a sprut cam user, it may not be the best video. There's a link in the description though where you can skip forward because what we did is we machined this piece here, which is a second muzzle brake. This one happens to be, it's the same design, except this is for 223 or 556. And, and then we actually machine the dimples itself. So there's some cool machining footage at the end of the video if you enjoy. Otherwise, uh, here we go with some uh, hardcore sprut cam work. Okay, so the end goal is to do two things. It's to get these dimples machined, and then it's to do some sort of a chamfer along the inside of these tines. Again, this is more, uh, both of these are aesthetic. I was joking that the dimples are for uh, increased surface area for heat dissipation, which uh, is half of a joke. The Knight's Armament suppressors do do that. Uh, I don't know how effective it is, but they tend to know what they're doing. And then the um, chamfering is more just to talk about fourth axis work again. So uh, I couldn't figure out the dimples for the life of me. Luckily, I actually had a chance to work with Russia. Uh, the folks in Spruce Camp Russia were super great. Um, well, they were great and they're helpful and they figured it out. They also sort of said, you cannot do this, do not do this, uh, does not work this way. So uh, mixed results, oh, we're gonna get it done. Here's the file that they sent back. They sent it um, two different ways. One way with the 3D contouring, one day with whole machining. Uh, I thought 3D contouring was going to make it quite easy because they had selected this uh, geometry, the split line along the hemisphere. But I later realized that's actually not true. They were really making use of this 2D geometry down here that they created. Same thing with the whole machining method. I uh, strongly dislike, to put it mildly, this tab right here in 2D geometry. I have, uh, I just horrendously dislike the, the way that screw cam handles that stuff. So uh, when I saw that, I thought, oh, that's a bummer. But I actually figured it out, again, using the 2D geometry and it's pretty simple. So let's take a look at how I did it, which is a very similar to uh, the uh, to Sprut Cam Rush's way with one actually, I think, pretty cool trick that they didn't do. So again, what I did was not go into 2D geometry, because I hate that, but rather just create uh, manual holes. And that's what's really easy about it. So if you take, um, you select the geometry right there and you go to model, and you go to this tab right here, which is probably properties, you can see the X min and the X max, and that tells you uh, where that hole is. In fact, if we, let's see if we can, I had to average two different ones, but maybe if we do it this way. Well, these turn out to be 1.52, I believe. Uh, yeah, exactly. So all that you do is create a hole. We'll do one just slightly off so you can see it. So X of one point um, 62, y is zero, diameter 0.25, click OK. Oops, um, too big a diameter. What did I do for these? 0.1, right? 0.1, it's parametric in the sense that you can edit it. And now we've got uh, the hole locations that we need. And I know that they were indexed 0.3 over, so I just manually created three. Um, there's actually another way we could do that as well. So 1.525, 825, 125. And then that creates your whole assignment. And then in the parameters, I just go down. Let's see, how did I do that? Um, okay, so I have a ball end mill. It's, that's correctly modeled. Feeds and speeds are fine. Uh, you know, I actually think. Um, for reasons that I don't necessarily understand, it recognized the geometry, which I know that sounds crazy, uh, but I remember not doing anything else. And if we simulate up to it, it worked. So um, I wish I had a more scientific explanation, but that worked. Now, I was really dreading the next set of holes because those are, um, those are rotated over 
10 degrees and I thought, oh shoot, I can't, um, I can't create a hole on a 10 degree, you know, I can't go in here and choose the A axis rotation. I can only choose the X and Y of it. And so I sat down and I thought, well, wait a minute here. When we did some other operations, we were able to rotate the A axis. So I created a new whole machining operation, rotated the axis 10 degrees, and then just created the exact same um, geometries I needed, the whole locations again based on where the, these two guys are, and then did the normal transformation of 20 steps around, or 20 degrees, 18 steps, 18 counts or holes around it, and wouldn't you know it? Go ahead and uh, render this. Works. So we've got our dimples now. Awesome. Move on to the chamfer. Now, I realize it's going to be difficult to do the chamfer because the way we would do the chamfer, selecting this edge, but we want the model to, we want the, I was actually talking to a customer the other day who was getting some Sprute Cam consulting help and he was asking a really good question which is, what is it with cam? Sometimes it relies on the 3D model, sometimes it doesn't. That's a great observation. A lot of times when you're doing something like a 2D contour, it just relies on the geometry that you tell it to in, in terms of it being a DXF or a line or curve and then the heights that you tell it to. When we use 2D contouring with the fourth axis, like I showed in this fourth axis video here where we just went through a whole tutorial step on the fourth, we saw that the fourth axis, when it's again with the 2D contouring, actually does make use of the part geometry. So what I found was if we have the dimples and we select this line, it's going to actually um, be affected by these intersecting dimples. So no big deal. Let's create a new file. So here we go, it doesn't have the dimples. So how do we create the 2D contouring operation? A couple little tricks, even, be, uh, even different than the last video. We're gonna do new finishing 2D contouring op. We're gonna first select the base surface. I find don't select the tube first because if you do select the tube, click base surface, you actually have to reselect it. And that was throwing me off this morning. So. Go ahead and just click base service, select this. That now auto populates or seems to in the right uh, areas. Click OK and then choose our curve like so. Turn that off and then we will do, remember when anytime we do a base surface, um, then the outside of the part becomes the Z0. So we're only gonna go down say 0.01 and change it to an engraver. quarter inch four flute for me and let's see what we get perfect look at that it's hugging the fourth axis you know contour as we'd like if we simulate it click play sorry I had the um, top level way too high, so top level 0.05, and we'll just make sure it's only a quantity of one. There we go. Now, if you see what's happening is we've got a problem. You're not seeing it here, because when we go to simulate this, you're gonna see it cuts a different size chamfer. Now, I'd love to hear from someone who really knows what they're talking about, why this does this. I, I don't know is the answer, but I think I figured out uh, just poking around how to solve it, which is go into the 2D contouring op under strategy, allow toolpath projection. Again, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to figure it out. And that's kind of how uh, I always work. And if I get it figured out, great. I, I do like to always understand why. And now, If we try this, we get a consistent path. It's deeper than I'd like. So let's see 
Now this is where things got hairy for me because it didn't seem consistent. I, I changed it from 15 thousandths down to like half a thou, which is ridiculous. But it did, if I recall, have the effect that I wanted. Yeah. Um, it's odd though, that, that that's far more than half a thousandth of chamfer, so I don't know how to explain it. Um, the other thing I think I did was added some stock, which hopefully, or added some offset there. Yeah, and what that does is it gets the, um, I'll show you from the side view. It gets the, um, it means you're engraving not with the very tipped, tip, tip of the um, engraver, but rather the sidewall, which is much better for tool life and performance. So watch this. Instead of going with the tip, you're going like halfway up of it. Now, one last thing. If you notice, we're getting a simulation that actually works. Normally, what happens is you get this massive chunk or cylinder in sprut cam and it doesn't actually have the geometry which you, that you want, which in this uh, example is really important. In fact, we'll just do that right now. I'll fast forward here to create a new part. So anytime you try to simulate or render it, you're going to be simulating in this giant chunk of material, which is not helpful at all for using the simulation to troubleshoot. So all you got to do is go into the model, select the workpiece, and then go to import and choose an IGIS file out of SolidWorks or your CAD that represents the model itself. And then that will override, rerun, reset, and rerun, and then reset this, and voila. I didn't have a, look at the correct toolpath set up here, but now all of a sudden it's, you created a manual workpiece quite easy. So, let's hop over to the mill. We're gonna do something I think cool, which is we're gonna do a really fast, you know, 40 minutes of machining condensed down into like 30 seconds so you can see this one being made. It's quite similar to the nine millimeter one. We'll start that right now so you can watch that. It's similar to the nine millimeter one, except this is gonna be for an AR-15. And then when we're done here, we will go a little bit slower to do the dimples and the chamfer.
So here is the final product. I think it looks beautiful. I hit it with a little scotch bright wheel to clean it up. I think the dimples look great. They're kind of the look I'm going for. If you don't like it, that's fine. It was more just a how-to sort of purpose. And then I didn't chamfer as much as I wanted after I deburred it and blended it in with the scotch bright wheel. A little bit of chamfer is sort of gone, but the cam was the important thing so you guys understand how to do it. Uh, I am going to Cerakote this part, but I realize it's, uh, it's better for its own video because there are a lot of folks who I think will be interested in Cerakoting, but, uh, but not necessarily the rest of the stuff. So uh, when I get that video posted, there'll be a link right here for the Cerakote process. Otherwise, folks, take care. Thank you for the comments, likes, thumbs up, shares. I will see you soon.